The heart is an exquisite pump. Perfectly timed electrical signals pace every beat. But without warning, those signals can turn to chaos or stop. It's called sudden cardiac arrest. And if blood flow isn't restored in minutes, brain damage will begin. In the late 1940s, with CPR still a decade away, doctors are trained to respond with a dramatic treatment. The heart appears to have stopped. Open the chest with any sharp instrument that is at hand and massage the heart between the flat of your hands. Physicians are urged to carry pen knives at all times. An enthusiastic doctor predicts even non-medical persons will be taught to open the chest and pump the heart. But one doctor isn't keen on the idea. Paul Zoll envisions a better way to rescue hearts and keep them beating for a lifetime. One by one, he will address the challenges of cardiac arrest and pave the way for today's electrical treatments, some so simple to use that medical and non-medical persons can and do rescue hearts with CPR and electric shocks without needing to open the chest. The year is 1950. The city is Boston. Upstairs at Beth Israel Hospital, Dr. Zoll cares for his heart patients. And downstairs in his basement lab, he looks for answers to their suffering. Zoll can't shake one patient from his thoughts. He watched helplessly as she died from Stokes Adams disease, a disorder of the heart's electrical system. In later life, he still reflects on this loss. I was very frustrated. There's nothing so important to a doctor as having something go wrong with a patient of his to whom he is responsible and can't do anything about it. It was awful. In Stokes Adams, the electrical signals that drive the heart become unreliable. The heart's pumping action may stop briefly, and the patient will faint, standstill, they call it. On television, Zoll explains the challenge. These episodes of cardiac arrest are likely to recur many times, so that we have, with Stokes Adams disease, the repeated emergency problem of resuscitating the patient from arrest and the additional problem of preventing these recurring attacks. Searching for answers, Zoll draws on his World War II experience when he assisted Dr. Dwight Harkin in bold new operations to remove shrapnel from the hearts of wounded soldiers, hearts that jumped with extra beats at the slightest touch. So the thought came that we might stimulate the heart electrically, externally, for emergency resuscitation. In the lab, Dr. Leona Norman Zarsky blocks electrical signals in animal hearts, and Zoll tries to jumpstart them with a borrowed electric stimulator. The idea of treating the heart with shocks isn't new, but if Zoll succeeds in driving a stopped heart externally, his work will be game-changing. After two years of research, he turns a dial and revives a human heart from total standstill. He's called Mr. A. As the machine beats his heart, he sleeps, eats, and complains about the hospital food. But when Zoll stops the shocks, he stops Mr. A's heart. A cardiac fellow panics. Maybe we shouldn't be doing this. For 52 hours, Zoll calmly persists until Mr. A's heart beats on its own. Dr. Stafford Cohen was a student and later colleague of Paul Zoll. When I was a medical student, there was very little that was dramatic in medicine. I think I clearly was excited to see somebody immediately revive who was on the brink of death, one foot in the grave. When Zoll publishes his work, he predicts that with a better electric stimulator, new cardiac treatments will be possible. To build a better stimulator, he'll need to build a strong team of collaborators. Paul had these wonderful people working with him. He didn't have to give them a lot of direction. They were self-motivated and they worked together. 
Between 2002 and 2009, Dr. Cohen commemorated his mentor's work by interviewing Zoll's team. Paul on one side of the table, I on the other, and Arthur Linenthal reading the EKGs, reams of EKGs. He didn't know what I was talking about on an electronic basis, and I didn't have any idea what he was talking about when it came to the heart, heart block, etc. And I started just to study like hell and learn all I could about the cardiac physiology, anatomy, and the rest of it. It was collaborative, but the initial ideas were Paul's. And we would just try many things, and there was never an objection to what you wanted to try. Everybody contributed to one another, and everyone supported one another, and got an answer. Belgard's Electrodyne Company starts making external cardiac pacemakers, and hospitals everywhere are happy to have them. The press is sensational. But Zoll is too modest to bask in the attention. Besides, there are other problems to solve. Cardiac arrest is a quick, silent killer. An emergency pacemaker is of little use without a monitor that alerts you to the emergency. Zoll and Belgar develop a series of alarmed cardiac monitors to watch over hearts at risk. They catch on quickly. The pacemaker monitors are meant for emergency hospital use, but Tony Chappelle tries one at home. When Tony's heart stops, an alarm sounds. By a flick of the switch, his wife can start the shocks. Or the machine can be set to do it automatically. The strong shocks are painful. Most patients, like Pinka Shapiro, can't bear them. Shapiro's doctor threads an electrode through a vein to his heart and lowers the voltage. This transvenous method works and soon becomes the standard. Zoll objects. It's too slow, too difficult, the infection risk far too high. He will remain firmly committed to external emergency pacing until he finds a way to ease the pain. Now that Standstill has a treatment, Zoll addresses ventricular fibrillation, a type of cardiac arrest where the heart quivers chaotically. He asks Belgard to design an external defibrillator to shock hearts back to normal rhythm. Critics say it's too dangerous. Zoll and Belgard simply get busy and do it. Zoll's team has now developed the key devices needed for a completely new program of care, the Coronary Care Unit. CCUs grab the public's attention. For the first time, doctors can do something to prevent death from cardiac arrest in hospitalized patients. For patients who've had a heart attack, the death rate drops by over 30%. The major things that he did in his lifetime were enormous, uh, groundbreaking, tectonic. And it's nice to know that if you're a patient who's suffering that you don't have to have your chest opened, that there were simpler ways to get the job done. It's 1960. The nation's goal is to put a man on the moon. For Zoll, the mission is closer to home putting a pacemaker in a human heart to prevent cardiac arrest. Zoll and surgeon Howard Frank are the second team to implant a self-contained permanent pacemaker in a patient. Like all the teams working on this challenge, they face technical complications that take years to fix. Batteries leak, electrodes fail, and wires snap from the stress of flexing with every heartbeat. Determined to find a solution, Zoll pays a visit to a wire company. How many times does this thing flex uh, that you worry about? It? I said, well, I said uh, 31 and a half million times a year, and I have a patient in the 20s. I want her to live another 50 years. I just thank God every day that he was there to do what he did. I wouldn't be here without him. In 1973, Zoll wins the prestigious Albert Lasker Award for Clinical Medical Research. He shares the moment with Mrs. Rogers. As the mother of three, she is proof of his core belief. It is possible to restore normal rhythms to the hearts and lives of those with cardiac rhythm disorders. It's 1980, and for the past 22 years, Paul Zoll has been a little annoyed. 
It's the transvenous method of emergency pacing that bothers him. He works with his son Ross to come up with a painless external pacemaker. One day, Alan Belgard came in with some sponge-type electrodes. We tried them, you know, of course, all our testing is done on ourselves. And, uh, you know, we were amazed. We said, you know, soon, the minute we tried them, we said, you know, it's a real possibility here. Work on the new emergency pacemaker marks the beginning of the company that will become Zoll Medical. And under Dr. Zoll's direction, the devices keep getting better. In 1993, Dr. Zoll says goodbye to his basement lab at the hospital and to his patients upstairs. He's 83. It's time to retire. I asked him, Paul, you know, you've done so much. What do you, what do you think about that as you look back upon this miraculous career that you've had? And he looked at me and said, with a moistened eye, there was so much more that I could have done. Today, Zoll Medical continues the work Dr. Zoll wanted to do. Groundbreaking work, done in the same spirit of collaboration, persistence, and commitment to the needs of patients and clinicians. Yeah, we continue to, to do new things. I see it with our, you know, the patents that we're coming up with every day. We branched out from being a uh, a little electrophysiology company doing, you know, a, a very niche product with pacing to thinking about how to help all the patients who are involved in, you know, any sort of critical care situation. We're willing to take on those challenges in the same way that Dr. Zoll did. He knew what was right and he went ahead and did it. The Life Fest changes the game for Zoll that we're providing care for patients outside of the hospital and outside of the emergency medical services system. LifeFest was an amazing situation where for many years they'd be just scoffed at like, Who, what are you talking about? And um, LifeFest is now become integral to the whole process of treating patients who have had heart attacks. I think that all the employees at Zoll understand that our mission is to improve outcomes. The people who work in manufacturing understand that their product has to be highly reliable and high quality in order for it to save someone's life. And we're doing a lot of work with pediatrics now and as a mom, it's very meaningful to me that I can help improve the care for pediatric patients. One of the most fun parts of uh, the job is collaborating with the scientists and clinicians. I collaborate with my colleagues at Zoll, with clinicians in the field, and that's how Dr. Zoll would have wanted it. We encounter clinicians like that still, and they're just incredible to work with. They love what they do, and they really care about their patients. You don't often have the chance in your life to do something that really is meaningful. And I feel like Zoll, Dr. Zoll in particular, but the Zoll Corporation in general, um, they really foster that here. What would Paul Zoll say today about Zoll Medical? I think he'd be very pleased.